Thanks, Bernie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Great. Excellent. Well, yeah, we're going to talk a lot about brand and how it could empower your product, service, and company. And I'm going to start right off with impact branding defined. And you can take notes, and then at the end, what I'm going to do, too, is take Q&A. Um, so impact branding defined is product or service identifying identity for the maximum customer retention and impact. And what I mean by that, if I, if I say like Disney, most of you have an inclination of what images come up to your mind are probably pretty common, you know, uh, Disneyland, Mickey Mouse, those, that's what I'm calling, talking about impact branding and things that are retained in your mind. Um, developing words and images to convey the impact benefits to the buyer instantly. So what I mean by that as well is branding you could equate with your image, a company's image. And also the words, like in an advertising or brochure or what comes off a website, all has a certain tonality to it that conveys that unified message as well. It motiv uh, motivates customers to inquire and purchase. Meaning here again, when it comes to impact branding, you look at a brochure, like let's say a Mercedes brochure comes to your desk, you're gonna actually look at the brochure, but what hits you first is its initial impact, the look and feel, the actual paper, the colors that they use, the overall vibe of it is gonna have you inquire about it or not, depending on how you're setting yourself up. So it also conveys status, uh, statue and trust, meaning that, and this, is, this holds true with 90% of companies and every company that I've ever seen where you have a new, oops, power just went. <coughs> oh, I know what's going on, excuse me. Ran out of battery juice. <laughs> <laughs> this has been running. Okay, let's continue on here. Sorry about that. Okay, um, there are more products. Oh, what, what I was saying before that, before my the battery ran out on my laptop, is that most companies, they don't set them, their image up appropriately. And when it comes to a company, when you're looking at the tangibles, that big part of the tangible is considered their brand perspective. And so what most companies do is they have something extremely valuable that they have to say what's going on in their inside reality, but how they're being perceived through the brochures, through their corporate identity, their packaging is way down here. So there's this huge gap between how they're being perceived and how they're actually stating themselves. So over 90% of companies are like this, where they're at an actually disadvantage, where they're actually creating a liability for themselves. So, and, and nowadays, it's, it's, it's pointing out here, it's more important than ever because there's more products and services out there, um, out there in the marketplace than ever before. So it's a question of how you're gonna stand out against your competitors. So you have to look at your overall image of your company. Otherwise, what happens is that if you're a consumer, which all of you are, if you go to the grocery store or wherever you may be, you have, you're looking on a shelf and there's one product that stands out, another product that might stand out, and other products that don't stand out. The, the point being is that the consumer, the customer has choices now. So they're gonna gravitate to the ones that stand out. Or also they'll switch you off. It's either they're gonna choose another product or switch you off. 
Um, impact branding is distinguishes you from brands which lack impact instantly because it's here again it's tangible and it happens instantaneously. Impact branding strategy is the first priority in executive, when it comes to executing a bit marketing plan. A business plan you can look at from the standpoint it's your overview of your company, from the standpoint of its vision, its mission, its objectives. And then a marketing plan is, well, how do you plan reaching a market? Well, a big part of that marketing plan inside of it should be the branding aspects as well, the brand strategies. And what I mean by either uh, the last line there, you're either branding consciously or unconsciously. Here again, on that 90% uh, percentile, you got companies that have an inside reality that's up here, and then you got the per their, their perception way down here. They're usually branding unconsciously. They're not, they don't, they're not aware of the impact they're actually making, which in this case is being ineffective. So why brand? Uh, with today's economy, graphic design, advertising, marketing, PR, fell if unsupported by impact branding. In the past, a lot of times, um, graphic design, actually I started, what was it, 15 years ago, started off as a designer. And back then it was enough. But here again, because there's so many products that are out in the market, it's not enough anymore. You have to look at from a strategy perspective. And a lot of what happens when it comes to branding is looking at your underlying strategies. Here again, you know, advertising at times was enough, and, uh, and at times PR was enough. But if you really want to look at the bigger picture down the line, you look at the overall branding aspect with all these key elements in place. Okay, the company's punch. What's meant by that is how would the consumer stay on your channel? It, and here again, what I mentioned a little bit earlier is your first impression. Your channel, meaning that you're connected, your product is connected with that customer, is its first impression. And we'll get into examples of what I mean by that as well, visuals. So the brand position focus on a buyer's benefits. And what I mean by that, like if you're looking at a package design, a lot of times when we're designing for, let's say, um, products that go into Toys R Us, we speak the value right on the package of what are the benefits to the consumer. And a lot of companies don't do that. They forget. You've got to look at from the standpoint, what are the effective advantages? Because you really only have a couple of seconds to obtain and retain that, that consumer to look at your product. Considering here again, there's a lot of these products that are on the shelf. So that's looking at the brand positioning. Uh, impact branding personalities, why should your audience like it? What I like to always start off with is use like adjectives. Think about your product, think about your company, your service. What are some of the key adjectives that you can use or nouns that what would attract your customers? Like is it innovation? Is it technology driven? Is it emotional impact? Is it based on humanity from the standpoint it's going to benefit a lot of people? Write things down from the standpoint what are these nouns and adjectives as a starting point of really recognizing how you're going to attract your customers. So in this case, this is a case study here, what we did for Fujitsu. Um, this is when it was the break of magneto optical drives, of being able to store material and remove material from hard drives. So we want to have a big splash where it's, it, was a, it was really something that would impact the consumer when they're looking through the Mac World magazine, Mac user magazines, and PC magazines. So we did something here again from the standpoint of innovation, that's something that's never been done before, where we combine all these images as one single shot and given the idea that you could store all this data on a hard drive, on a magneto-optical drive. So by turning the page, you get this initial impact, here again, the first impression, and then it ties it up in a, in a headline as well. So that's how this company started to get established for its removable hard drives and make it into marketplace when it comes to technology. The second point is looking at your mission and objectives. And what's, what I mean by that and some of the key elements in doing this is here you have something, you know, something valuable that you want to bring out to the public, to your consumer, to your customers that has a value up here. 
Well, the first thing you have to look at from the standpoint, can you back that up? Let's say like with, um, well, let's take like FedEx, you know, the whole thing is being able to deliver a package overnight. Can he actually back that up? And that's actually creating a promise to the consumer that they can now deliver on that promise. That's really key because a lot of companies, they'll make a promise and they won't deliver. What happens is that it really hurts them because word of mouth will spread that you're not able to deliver. So you have to look at what are some of the key attributes about your company that you could claim from the standpoint of satisfying your customer or consumer. So look at it from the standpoint. Uh, sequence. How will your niche marketing plan apply and use in Power Brand? What I mean by that is like, well, what do you plan doing? Looking at your product and looking at the delivery on that promise. What about distribution? How do you plan doing and delivering and what is the sequence? So then write down from the time that a consumer buys your product or you have a service to offer, how do you plan backing that up and then sequencing it? So then you know if there's any holes and what are your backups within that system. The value proposition um, are the benefits of your product or service. Here again is what is it that you can claim about your product, your service that nobody else can claim and have as your own. That's a, that's a big part about the benefits of the value proposition when it comes to branding. Line, ex line extensions, this is, this is a really key point. When it, comes to, when it comes to your product, you have to think too, well, what are some of the other products down the road? You might be thinking about what you want to create right now from a product to get out to the market for the first year, but to keep your company moving and keeping and expanding and having different market strategies and different demographics, you could create multiple profit centers by looking at that product and looking at brand extensions. For example, like you know, BMW, they got the 300, the 500, 700, 800 series. They give the idea to the consumer that they could always move up with their line of extensions. So you know, think of it that way. What can you do that you give options to your consumer? You give them multiple lines of products that they could actually move up to. Um, you take like an example like General Motors, for example, they got Saturn and they got Pontiac and they got different other lines of products of different cars, but they're all reaching different demographics. Because here again, your product might reach a certain uh, demographic, but what about all the other demographics as well? You know, when it comes to age, gender, culture, is it global, is it local? So you got to look at from all the different aspects. You could hum come up with this whole line of products they can hit many, many um, markets and leverage the brand. So one of the first things when it comes to branding, if you have an existing company, the CEOs and the marketing people and brand strategists, they will look at the existing customer and do an analysis. And this is where a lot of companies fail to do is to get feedback from their customers of what the dislikes and likes of their products or services or even the company's image. So the first thing is really look at um, the company profile or the customer profile, excuse me. And then look at the competitive analysis, meaning, meaning look at your competitors and see what they're doing. If they're doing something, a lot of companies that stay ahead of the game and stay ahead of the curve are generally the ones that are always thinking larger and moving more innovatively than a guy next door. So with your company as well, look at the competitors and decide on what things you can do to bring your product up based on your competitors and then bring it up a notch further. That's really key is looking at your competitors and then looking at what can you do to leverage your product even that much further to give that much more benefit to the consumer. Uh, Self-analysis, um, this is huge. This is where, you know, here again, over 90% of companies fail. Is when, it, when I mean by doing a self-analysis, looking at your marketing materials from your brochures, your websites, your trade show booths, you know, your product design, your products themselves, 
is looking at the integration. Most companies fail because a lot of times there's a lack of integration, like they have different looks between what they have the brochure look compared to their website, compared to their products that are on the shelf. There's an inconsistency. What happens is that then you're actually fragmenting your company's image and you look like multiple companies. You actually look like a schizophrenic company <laughs> because people don't know who you are. And you're actually losing value in your company and equity and it's becoming a huge liability as well to your company's image. So, but if you look at HP, if you look at Apple, if you look at one or more well brand names like a Coca-Cola or Pepsi, there's a consistency between all their different touch points, which I'll get into a little bit later. But look at the holes in your integrations. Uh, team players, this is huge. Look at the distinctive roles in your team as far as your businesses and maybe perhaps you might need, when you go through IBI through this course of this week, you might find that you need to expand on your team players. Like for instance, you might need a promotional video and you find that, like Richard Crawford, who's another instructor here, that does that to help promote or actually has it where you could actually put in a kiosk. So you'll find ways that you could actually expand your company's image. Um, by the way, th what I find in most companies is what you need is uh, um, you need, first of all, um, legal to make sure that your company is protected appropriately and properly. Um, finances, you know, through investors or self-financing or banks. And then you need marketing and you need branding and you need um, PR eventually. And then you need also project managers to manage all the different things that go on. So this is an example of where CNC Partners, we did a self-analysis on our company. This was their old identity. And this is, this, this unexplained the gap between where they are, where they were and where they'd like to have been. So with CNC Partners, they do remodeling of, of homes. And they're located locally here in the Redondo area. And their image, they're only getting and working within their demograph. And when I'm talking about their demograph, I'm talking about geological demograph, uh, geography demograph. And then what they wanted to do, though, is they wanted to build remodel homes in the richer areas of Los Angeles, like Palos Verdes, you know, Beverly Hills, so forth and so on. But with their current image, here again, they have the quality to do that, but with their outside reality of how they're being perceived, they're, they weren't able to penetrate the market through their corporate image, just through their corporate identity, which their corporate identity, by the way, corporate identity is one of the key components to your company's image. It's literally your identity to your company. It's different than a logo. And the way I distinguish a logo, anyone can design a logo, but when it comes to corporate identity, it could take several months to design one that really fits the company's vision and where it's heading. So this is the image that they had before. And then this, this is what we created for them on the right-hand side that really now distinguishes them. It gives them a classy feel with the colors, the typography. All that adds up to the psychology of why someone would choose them versus this, even though it's the same company. So we ran with this and we created a brochure for them. And then what happened, just to show you what happened with this company, is that we drove them from three million to six million, six million in one year, just by changing their corporate identity and their brochure, because now they're being seen differently. And there was a 80% of homes were due to their corporate identity and their brochure. This is what the CEO wrote me. That was actually what happened here again within the first year and a half. 80% of the homes were due to their new image. And then now they're remodeling more homes for more money. So they're actually then created a, a more money per hour, you could look at it from that standpoint. And they capture a much broader target audience too. So now they still have their local from the high end standpoint, but now they're reaching all of LA. So now they've taken it from a very small region and spread it out. But that came out of, first of all, knowing where they wanted to head. And that was sitting down with them, understanding their vision, understanding their mission, understanding their marketing, understanding what they're currently using as far as their touch points, doing a self-analysis, finding out what, what the customers, their current customers liked about them. 
So all that came into play from the standpoint of positioning them. So there's also what's called brand integration. And there's several ways of doing a brand integration like product, the impact packaging here again, when it comes to product, your packaging is so important. Plus, what's really important as well is the product, the product designing now. Because of technology, product designing, you could do so much more than what you could do just even a year ago. I mean, just look at automobiles, cars, for example. There's so much that's going on with hybrid cars, you know, with a new BMW, the 500 series, it's beautiful. There's all these little things that are happening because now with technology, you could actually mold things differently and you have that flexibility as far as the manufacturers. So look at your product. When you, if you have a product that you want to bring out in market, you could actually really create something that people want to have in their home and actually have it where it's on their counters or wherever it may be that it actually becomes part of the furniture. So that becomes a big part of it. And then how it's packaged becomes a huge part of it as well. So you could become recognized and distinguished again. Um, service impacted deliverables mean that the one, number one thing that's, that's fallen out of companies is customer service. So if you're talking about a service, look at it from a standpoint, how can you deliver on what you say you're going to deliver? Look at your customer service first and look at the system that you're going to create and look at the system from the standpoint of where the breakdowns may be. Here again, outline it. Like if someone calls, what happens to that call? Okay, all the way from the return of the call or non-return of the call, whatever it may be, break it down and you'll find out how you can become more efficient with your company as well. Okay, I, IBI is a perfect example of an organization from the standpoint of an integration. And then personality types, you can look at Oprah and, and um, BJ Dorman, more and more he's getting out there as well. So he's becoming, you can look from the standpoint of where he was on the background, where he's becoming on the foreground. So look at your company as well. If you plan to do a lot of keynote speaking, being out there in the field in the industry, you yourself as a CEO may be part of that brand equation. Uh, brand as a course. How do you plan to capture your target audience? And what is your core? Here again, which you'll find out in David Fowler's class when it comes to uh, marketing niche, um, you'll find out how to actually then strategize from a funnel standpoint to the broadest point all the way down to what is your specific niche? What is it that you are claiming here again that everything is built around that company? That's the core. An experience would be like IBI Global. This is an experience. You're going through an actual form that you're experiencing. And that's actually really powerful because now it's becoming more, you know, involving more your senses. Uh, the functional, which you'll, you'll actually, actually be part of this later on this week. It is a super teaching rooms. The emotional would be like um, the book in the, in the tape series, Let's Talk Relationships. These are all the different aspects that your, your brand could come from, you know, from experiential. Like another example would be like Starbucks. You walk through, you get an experience, Disneyland. The functional could be like uh, General Motors or trucks, certain trucks. Uh, emotional, you know, could be let's talk relationships. Visual could be like Xbox, where it has to need a lot of high visuals. Same with television. Also used for video. Video, you need a lot of high juice behind it what Richard Crawford delivers on visuals. Um, and then there's a rational, for example, when it comes to automobiles, would be Volvo. And they built their whole company around their, they were the first ones that come out with a three-point belt system, seat belt system. That's what actually made them known. And then they built their whole image around that. That's what they claimed. So here again, they did something and built around it, and now they're known for safety. Uh, constant brand elements. These are things that will always remain, generally speaking, the same. If they start shifting or changing, you're going to lose a huge part of your customer base. 
and your whole culture. You know, what I mean by that is the people that you relate to. Your product is relating to a certain group of people, whether you know it or not. It's better if you know it, because then you could actually then build more your image around that. Um, but when, I, when the company name is one of the key components to a company, and um, there's what you'll find out in a Maria Spetz class around trademarks, it becomes extremely valuable, the company name, and there's different ways, which I won't get into, because Maria Spetz will actually cover it on trademarks, different levels. Um, the market would be like Nike Swoosh, for example. Um, I have, you know, my whole thing about marks, that it should be simple, powerful, and unique. You know, you boil it down to that, and, but it's complicated to get it that simple. Um, but generally speaking, if you can make it simple and powerful and unique, here again, it gets retained in the mind, and it doesn't get lost. Colors, colors are huge. Colors play huge psychology on us. There's, you know, I remember spending eight years in college studying multiple majors, but I spent literally eight years understanding colors. There's all these different principles that are involved that will always stand the test of time when you start understanding the theories behind them. But colors play a huge role. Like, you, you, like Kodak, for example, they trademarked that yellow in the film, with film processing. You could recognize Kodak just by their yellow and nobody else can touch it because they trademarked it. That's worth billions of dollars to that company, that color yellow. That, you take, um, take you know, Mattel as well with Barbie line, the pink, um, and I can go on and on. But colors play a huge role as well. Here again, these are things that add up value to the company's image. And here again, we use our sense, the number one sense we use is our visual, 90% more than the other senses. So that's why this is all very important to your company's image. And this is the tangibles. Uh, slogans impact the buyers to action. You know, for instance, um, well, Nike. The Nike would be what? Just do it. So here again, that that's has a direct impact. That has a direct correlation to you as a consumer that you could actually be a great athlete as they promote, you know, Magic Johnson and other element, key, key people, personalities to their brand. There's a whole strategy around that. But I'm just saying slogans um, impact the buyer into action as well. Slogans and taglines. Um, here is another example just to show you the overall strategy as well with framed openings they do. Um, this was their old image. And here again, they, what they do, they specialize is hardwood floors, skylights, frames, doors, windows, glass. And they do beautiful work. But here again, their image um, this is like first level, the first level when it comes to different tiers as far as a corporate identity class. But this is very descriptive. This is like, you look like anybody else. It's very generic. It's framed opening. They're being so literal that they could be mistaken for any other company that's out there. And not only that, but they're actually positioning themselves as being a small time company, like a local shop. They want to hear again. They want to make it where they become more national, international known. And they're just known here in LA as a very small company, barely even that. So here again, we, you know, looking at the inside reality, where are the holes, where are the consistencies, and how are they being perceived by their customers? So this is on the right shows what we did for them from the standpoint of creating a really strong mark, the typography. This all creates an emotional connection with the consumer as being a higher end product. And then what we looked at was the brochure, creating a whole new brochure for them that was more innovative because that's what they were about. They were talking about being classy as well, so we took a very nostalgic typeface. And we took the colors from the corporate identity, keeping that consistent through the brochure. Here again, once you create the brochure, you're establishing certain patterns that would follow through with the rest of your theme or your other touch points. Your other marketing material, what I mean by touch points, your marketing material as well. And then we carry that theme through through their website. So then this is a huge website. I think there's like 25,000 products. But we created this whole way of e-commerce that now people could shop online. So we look at their competitors, and nobody had a really nice website. So we wanted to take advantage of that. And so we drove the price point up too as well. So we were able to sell 
what they could service on their website for their products at a higher price point because they're perceived as being more quality driven. And so as a result, within the first year, um, we drove them from the 100K to the $1 million mark. And then that was in the first year, and now they're in double digits. And after, this year, after the second year, they moved into double digit millions. In addition with that, they actually had a, they had a breakdown. This was on a delivery because they didn't know what we were going to do was going to have a, a huge impact on our business. They had so much business coming in, they could not respond quickly enough to their customers. And not only that, but their actually um, fulfillment house was too small too. So they actually had to buy a whole property next door and redo everything to fulfill on their, on their promise that they made to their customers. So they increased in uh, store and bought the actual property, increased in market share, customer loyalty, and they actually are um, growing very, very, very rapidly right now, even, even in this economy. Um, so number step seven is protect your brand. This is really key because like with your corporate mark, according to trademark officers, it becomes seven times, minimum seven times value than the overall company's image. The actual value, the actual value of your company, the mark becomes seven times more value than that. And the reason being is because there's so much identity that's built up and so much trust that's built up to your company's touch point, key touch point, which is your corporate identity. So for like example, if I was gonna put the Nike swoosh on a line of clothing that wasn't produced by Nike, that would actually move that product just by that swoosh because all that swoosh is representing is that whole company's philosophy. So you, you're getting that? It's, it's, it's creating a tangibility be, between that and the untangible, which is your intellectual property of your company, which is all the, the, the vision of your company, everything. That's why your company mark is so important and the colors and the systems and style guides, that all plays a critical role. So protecting it is, is extremely crucial. Here again, you'll find out a lot with Maria Spetz class. Impact brands are priceless size assets. That's, what you're, that's when a company wants to buy another company or buying it for the entire image. You know? Besides a hard dollar figure amount and what it's worth, but also the, the potential for growth as well. Uh, so trademarking the company, name, slogans, terms, terminologies, copywriting is important when it comes to, you know, if we're creating a game, you want to copyright, so no one else can use it, that's extremely important as an intellectual property. Um, trade secrets, um, sometimes you don't want to tell anybody what you're doing because it's so unique. There's a lot of things that in our company that we do that no one else is doing. I don't tell people what we're doing because it's our trade secrets from an innovative standpoint. And then there's executing a brand. So now that you've created this brand image and you create the tangibles behind it, how do you plan to get it out there in the marketplace? How do you plan getting your product, your service, and your company known out in the marketplace? So then we go into the impact touch points. Um, here again, now your brand takes on a physical form. Here's your inside reality of your intellectual property, the value of your company, all that you know it can deliver, the interior, what happens with your team, you know, your employees, the deployer relationship, everybody that's involved. Well now what you're gonna be doing is taking it on to a physical form so people from the outside can get that as well, but in a matter of seconds. They don't have to read your vision, they don't have to read your mission, they don't know, even know they need, need to know your objectives. They just need to know what is it that they, what's in it for them that they could believe in. So then we go into what are the impact points? Well, there's print, um, which print pretty much covers a lot. Uh, retail design, let's say your product's going in a store, the point of purchase displays, is a huge way of using really cool real estate within a store so it creates more of a buzz and creates more of a magnet, more of a flow to your product. Uh, customer care, your TV, radio, PR, websites, even mobile phones now, you want to look at the latest technology and take advantage of that as far as your touch points as well. Um, packaging, it goes on and on. Basically a touch point is any time there's a 
basically what I mean by that is basically any time there's a, 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 a contact of your product or your service or your company's image to your consumer through some sort of material, some sort of physical form. Um, are all your impact points integrated, which we talked about that a little bit earlier? Is there an integration, a system behind it? And then brand, here, brand as a creation, I'm going to show you another example. Um, this company wanted to break the market with the new horse the packaging into the market, and they wanted to have it in Costco, Target, Toys R Us, but they wanted to compete against Hasbro and um, uh, Mattel and all the big players. And so we had to look at, from a strategy standpoint, how we were going to do that. The first thing, it's a, it's a horse. Basically, the, the product is a horse, but we took advantage of today's technology where it's for little girls and it, it talks to you as you pet it, as you comb its hair. And, and they, all these horses have different attitudes too because, <laughs> <laughs> because we took a look at the girls nowadays, teenagers, they have a lot of attitude. You know, back you know, much more than 15 years ago or even five years ago. And so we want to create the name of the overall product and we knew that there was going to be a series of products. So we had two hip, the trot, sidekicks, getty up girls, sassy stables. We came up with literally lines and lists and lists of names. Then we had to chisel it down and find out what was legally taken and what's not. So then we had to work with the trademark officer and find out what we could actually trademark and have them claim this as their own. And once we landed on sassy stable, then it was created the product ID. Like, how is it going to be used? Well, we knew it was going to be used for print, radio, for web, um, for film, everything on the product itself. So then we, had a, we figured out all these different solutions of creating that certain feeling and that vibration to reach the culture, which were teenage girls. And once that was created, we came up with the final corporate identity, the product ID. And I'm looking, I'm showing you on a very short time span, and, and you're seeing only cuts of it, but there's literally like 15 steps between each step that I'm showing you here. And it's, the, corp, the product ID took itself, I think, five weeks to create. Um, and then we went through, you know, the color theory behind it and what colors would work and why, and print, for, and print to web, all these different, you know, approaches and principles that we had to take in consideration. And then this is the competitor's box, which pretty much hasn't changed since over the years when my, my sister used to play with horses. It's pretty much, you know, the, this is pretty typical what we found in, in Toys R Us, is being a premium item. So we knew that they weren't taking advantage of the packaging, technology, um, colors, being current. Everything was missing as far as this package was to be in this current marketplace. So the first thing that we did is then address the package after the corporate uh, product ID was designed is look at different ways of packaging this product with you know, acetate on the cover so you could see the product itself and actually have what are, what are called um, hot buttons so you could actually touch the product as well. And uh, tr they're called try me buttons, and we design a lot of revolutionary designs here that haven't been seen, as far as curves and taking advantage of uh, material, different substrates from the paper itself to the acetate. And then we also want to look at, from the standpoint, the back of the packages, how we could upsell and cross sell for the line of products. There are other horses that were coming out, and then. Um, here again, you're seeing this tight evolution. Um, but then once we figured the colors and we figured out the placement of the call-outs on the side, everything about it, we created this 3D model. And that's not the horse. The horse is a lot cooler than that. It's more like on the back of the package, but we wanted to just place it, just figure out the dimensionalities and how it would fit in that environment. In Sienna, the horse Sienna is a painter, so we want to have an easel and give this feel like she's a really a painter. And there's Roxy, who's a singer. So here again, fulfilling on that continuity of that overall vibe. <laughs> and then here's the actual product itself. 
And then this is the back of the packaging here again, selling, cross-selling. The line of extensions, there's Shimmer, Morgan, Roxy, Sienna. And then a little story behind each one of them because we're looking down a road how this can tie into websites, how they could get other products moving as well down a road. And then this is how they're sold on the shelf. So you could see them on a the side. We want to take advantage of every piece of that real estate. So every little tiny inch matters. I mean, I'm, for me, it's a sixteenth of an inch clearance. So you got to look at every little aspect of it and see how you could take advantage of it and how it would actually impact on a shelf and what does the competition look like and how it's going to be placed and where on the shelf. So we had to go to the Toys R Us, Target, and figure out the placements of all these shelves what was going to actually be held for them. First, we had to create what are called presentation boards so the store buyers would buy off on it. You know, and that's a key thing, to make it as realistic as possible. That's why we went with 3D modeling, because here again, the buyer has all these products to choose from every day. So you want to have a huge impact to saying, hey, this is the right one, and these are the reasons why. So then once they insured us on a, on a, short, on a space, a shelf space, we had to look at the positioning of it. Well, each shelf has different, different heights, and each company has their own parameters. So you're talking about three weeks of research just in that. This is, um, this is how a, a project, brand project flow sheet looks like. Or this is how we create it. Here again, everybody has their own way of when it comes to brand strategists and designers, they all have their different methodology. This is the one I find over 15 years had to be really effective, and it works every single time. And that's from working with, you know, Fortune 100 companies, why things did not work. But anyways, you got the CEO, you got your marketing manager, and then you got your brand consultant. And generally speaking, there'd be like an arrow between the two, between the brand consultant and the marketing manager, because they need to converse a lot of information back and forth. And then you got the CEO at the top, and I like working directly with the CEO because I want to make sure that we're covering his or her ver uh, vision of the company and product lines. So there's tight communication so there isn't this gap between someone else because a lot of information gets lost in the translation then. And then you got underneath the brand consultant is a creative director, art director, and then um, production manager. And then you got a whole line of things that happen underneath the production manager or art director, which is designer, copywriter, the vendors. You got all the other elements that come into place. And generally speaking, too, on the outside, really there would be, in, in larger projects, there would be um, a, project, a project manager, not a production manager, but a project manager to make sure here again everything's built on timelines, that things are going to be met at critical times. Because if you want to get on a shelf on a store, there's times that companies will look at your shelf for next year, and there's very specific niches and very specific time frames. And if you miss that, you have to wait a whole other year. So that's where the project managers really comes in handy to figure out how it's going to coordinate all these different things to get managed. From the standpoint of printing, from the standpoint of the product designing, the printing, the package designing, everything. So it's all related. So there might be a list of 30 people underneath that. Um, then the ninth point is on distribution. Which media are you currently using and why? So you want to look at your own company right now from the standpoint, what, what, kind of, what current media are you using and why? A lot of people just say, oh, I want to have a website, but they don't know why. And they don't even know why they would want to have the, what they want to have that website to do, other than having they want to have a website, which is actually good that they want to have a website. But what do you want it to have it do? What are the what what everything that I look at and that you should look at is everything that you create should have a benefit, create value for the company, equity for the company, and have some sort of payoff as an investment. What I mean by that is that it should be like at least a 10 to 1 ratio. Every dollar you spend, $10 back. But you have to have a really strong strategy of having that occur. If you don't, you're just throwing money away. There's like there's two ways of when it comes to designing and branding is that you're either, you're either um, 
creating a, uh, be, having it be a cost for the company or you're having it be an investment into the company. So th when it comes to cost, what I mean by that, most companies, they'll want to do something that they want to put out a fire now. They need, you know, I just got a call from, you know, Extreme Makeover and they want to have one of the doctors just call me and say they want to have a website up before the next show comes up. Well, that's like three weeks. That's like, uh, you know, you can't, you can't create anything that would have that huge of an impact with that much value in that short period of time. That's how most companies think, though. They think they, they, they need something and get it now. They can, but it'll cost them big time because they'll probably end up sending the wrong message, be less effective, cost the company far more if they were going to set it up right the first time. So you really want to look at, are you actually creating things that are going to be here again in equity, value for the company, or actually a liability, or be a cost to the company? And to get things done right, it takes time. And that means, you know, to have that timeline spread out. Um, trade shows are huge for a lot of companies. Um, you know, here again, talking about timelines, time, trade shows, generally speaking, just on the production of a trade show, they usually need two months minimum to build a trade show. And it's not just building it, but actually testing the colors to make sure things are done right, files aren't corrupted, things that are unforeseen, you know, are handled. So, and delivery, you know, we're creating for one of our clients a trade show that's being built in Germany. That takes time and getting it shipped over, then setting it up, make sure nothing's left out. Here again, you want to look at what are you creating, how much time does it actually take? And that's when your art director, your brand consultant, they should know those answers by their experience. Uh, web e-commerce is a way of distribution here again. Here again, I, 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 you know, here again, a lot of times people want a website, but always look at from the standpoint what can leverage the company. It's not just going to be a brochure online, although most of them are. What advantages do you want to have it by being online? You know, what are the key, key, key elements? Um, direct sales, another way of distribution. I can go on and on. QVC, which you'll meet Serge Cavell, getting things on a home shopping network. Uh, catalogs, either through online or through traditional ways of print. Okay, number 10, leveraging your brand. Can a brand go local to global and in what sequence? Uh, if you have a company, you got products and services, look at it from a standpoint right now. How can you take your idea? How can you make it go global? And what do you need as, as far as team players, which I would strategize by utilizing IBI this week for that. And then also look at from the standpoint of sequencing. What would be first step, second step? And you don't need to know all the answers. You got the right team players you know, on your team, they would have a lot of the answers to support you. And that's what, what's so awesome about IBI. You'll find a lot of team players of what you're needing. And that's when you want to use a lot of the bulletin boards as well, the, the well boards. Um, can you create a line extension, which we talked about for your brand, create more profit centers and exposure? That's what happens a lot of times when you create a line extension. It creates more exposure you're actually becoming more known to more people because you're hitting different areas. So more people will get to know you. Um, just an example here, like what IBI has done is creating sub-brands. Um, the IBI success channels, the super teaching, the biz clubs that Bernie was talking a little earlier, um, Million Dollar Dreamers, which is gonna be creating a TV show, um, movies about BJ, Dorman's life. Here again, these are, this is an example of creating sub-brands of your overall brand name. See, it's IBI Global, keeps it open-ended. It doesn't have a lid on it, you know, so meaning that you could have all these different sub-brands that go underneath that architecture. Here again, it's like taking like, I know I use this example, but it's a good one from the standpoint of General Motors. General Motors, General Motors, right? It's very general. Then you got all these defined products like Pontiac, Chrysler, so forth, Buick, so on, so on that's defining a specific product. And then you got even sub brands below that. So here again, if you want to look at it from an architecture standpoint, look at it from a flow chart. Would this give you a limitation like 20th Century Fox, for example? 20th Century, you're saying 20th Century, they limit themselves. They weren't thinking ahead, right? 
So, <laughs> so, you know, things like that matter. Now they're stuck. Now they're stuck as being something in the past rather than something of the future. This is so crucial. Um, licensing opportunity, you know. So Rand here. Right, you stand up, Rand. He's an, are you going to be teaching, right, this week? Oh, you taught already? Okay, he, go to him. He could hear again, you know, when it comes to license opportunity, there's so many possibilities of licensing your products and doing co-branding, getting your product. Here again, you're getting your product more out there. For that, uh, it wasn't on here, but a product that we did for Jack Specific that we got into, um, you know, Target, all the major brand names, they actually then licensed it to uh, Radio Shack as a bonus. And Radio Shack has thousands of outlets throughout the U.S. So now their brand is being even more recognizable through more touch points centers. Um, what we did for King of the Hill, we created a whole way of sequencing and creating a whole brand architecture but behind their show. So all the licensee has to use these particular layouts. There's actually you know, 30 other ones. But to show you an example, that the colors are chosen through what I call the Pantone color system and CMYK system and RGB system for web. Nevertheless, and all the breakout of all the key elements and the corporate identity, the product ID, all the other companies have to use this consistent, what's called a style guide. And if they didn't, then everybody would be doing their own thing. Here again, it would be dividing up the brand's image and splintering it rather than keeping it uniformed and therefore being a liability to the company and creating a cost for the company rather than an asset. Um, managing the impact. Um, do you have a brand manager, outsource, or in-house? Um, is your brand image fresh and current? And here again, you take any company like AT&T, um, Provident Mutual, they've all gone through different transformational state to keep their image current. Look at what Coca-Cola, look at Pepsi. Here again, you want to be current and fresh. And that's why the name is important, because even though they may change their product ID from five years to five years or 10 years or whatever it may be, their name remains the same. If they convoluted it or change it, it could cause problems like AOL and Time Warner. That was a major you know, headache for them, co-mingled. Co-mingle two cultures. That's what they did, essentially, and it didn't work. Um, do you have a, an impact policy guy, meaning, meaning here again, like a style guide, for example? Um, do, you have, do you have actually a manual, in a sense, so everybody is aligned with the vision and the objectives of the company based on the market strategy of the company? A lot of times, you know, a company a lot of people are not aligned because they don't know the CEO, who's a visionary, is where they're heading. So everybody's doing their own thing or speaking on the phone or a different tone. Well, then here again, you're splintering your image. So it's really important to actually have a guy so then someone that you just hire could understand what you're creating, what you're creating, what the overall image is about, and how you want to speak it powerfully to your consumer or customer. That's extremely important to have a, have a guide around that. Um, do you stay in communication with your employees? Here again, marketing, branding team, to renew the impact for the customer world from the inside of your company, what we just discussed just now. A lot of times, um, CEOs forget that they do have to stay in communication with their employees. Um, and so that's where mischief happens, you know. And ultimately, when it comes re to the responsibility of the brand, it's ultimately the CEO's responsibility, you know, making sure he or she knows where he or she wants to drive that vision of that company. Now I am open for Q&A. And by the, by the way, um, um, I will be available to have half-hour conversations not during IBI time, class times, but outside. And if you're interested in a one-on-one -on -one with your company, come see me during the breaks or during the, during the meal breaks, and we could arrange that. But now I'm open for uh, Q&A up front. Howard, I'm back on point number six. When you talked about the company name, you mentioned that the company name conveys the buyer culture. Can you speak more about the company name and how it conveys the culture 
Yeah, that's good. Um, Would you question? Here, I'll hand out the mic. You use a second mic. That's probably a good idea. Thank you. So back in point number six, you spoke about uh, the company name and how the company name conveys the buyer culture. Okay. And I'm just, if, I wonder if you can elaborate on what that means, how the company name can convey your culture or the buyer culture. Well, there's, a, well, let's just start with the name itself. What, you know, there are different levels of defining a company name, product name, or service. There's, you know, when it's stamp, it, it, there's one, the first, first level, and you're thinking of different level, levels and tiers, there's more where you're just being so literal, you know, like framed openings, for example. And then there's another level where you're being more suggestive of what that product or company does. And then there's another one, another level that's higher than that, which is more abstract. And there's another, you know, like for instance, not completely, but Nike, for example. And then you go even higher than that, where like Google, for example, you know, where it's completely made up. Um, that defining what the culture is starts first of all with understanding your market, your 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 culture. Who, with your product, let's say Apple. I mean, I've been working. I love Apple's products. Cause I've been working with 20 years, and it's design. It's actually here. It is. It's positioned it for me as being the end user. I'm the culture for the creative. I love Apple because they're always they're always thinking from the creative standpoint, from their product, from their interface. They first had to know and define who I am first to develop the product. And then they came up with a name, Apple, from the standpoint that Apple was giving a whole new meaning than your fruit. Okay? So it's taken on a whole new meaning. And then what they did is they came out with the Macintosh, which is a product line under Apple. And then talk about line extensions, you know, they got the iPod you know, and the iMac, they created that whole i thing, and now a lot of companies are jumping on a bandwagon. But then they thought of it as being interactive, but how can they reach that culture, the innovative people, the creative people, and what they would gravitate towards. And there isn't one way of getting there. There's so many different directions of getting to that name, but a lot of it comes from understanding who's your market, and who do you want to sell to, and why. And then what's your specific niche is key. Okay. Uh, question? Back there. Are there certain colors that go with certain um, uh, types of businesses? For instance, the health industry. Mm -hmm. Would there be any colors that would be, um, would relate that? better than other colors? Uh, yes and no. Um, <laughs> because in, when, it comes to, when it comes to colors, you're dealing with so many different attributes, you could say. There's like hue, like red, green, and blue. Okay, so when it comes to like, let's say health, for example, generally speaking, you would not use red in most cases because it's associated with blood. And then, you know, you use green or blue, which has a more higher vibration as health, especially blue. Okay, but then you're talking about just that hue. Then you got all these different tonalities of that blue, which are limitless. Mm -hmm. And then you got what's called the intensity or the value of that blue from light to dark. So like from a really strong vivid color to like a pale pastel color. So that's, you know, so you're working off three axes. So generally speaking, there are kind of like more or less like industry colors, you know, more or less. But but then I like breaking the rules too. So then you stand out, you know, and it could be slight subtle changes or a complementary color to that blue. Let's say you're in a health industry and your primary color is blue. You could then use a secondary color that associates another core value of your company's vision or project or mission or objectives. So then there's ways of integrating other color systems into it and then expanding that color. So, there is psychologies behind colors, but there's also ways of knowing the rules and then breaking the rules. The only way you could break a rule is if you know the rule, you know, <laughs> to do it effectively. And then you could actually come from another angle that you stand out. I don't know, Howard. I break the rules and I don't know that I'm breaking them. <laughs> uh, question, uh, and this is generic, the average cost of, of branding a product, and I'm sure it's 
product specific, could go up. but any of the examples that you gave us today, uh, kind of an idea of what kind of cost you might anticipate? Yeah, well, you know, what I do for IBI is far less, it's like literally about 25% of what I charge outside. Generally speaking, just to give you an idea, like corporate identities, I charge 50 grand in startup. Um, and then for IBIs, it's like 10 and a half, so I do it at cost. And it takes about eight weeks long. There's 12 distinct trademark secrets, but it works every single time. So that's just to give you an idea. When it comes to full brand strategies, like we're working on a, on a um, telecommunication company right now, um, we're looking probably at like a, a 150, and we worked on the first, we broke it up into segments. In the first segment, they've actually seen a return. They've made, I think he said, 15 million dollars already just on our new position that we've taken. And so now we're designing our trade show booth and all these other elements, and this whole award system, everything about them. And then at another company, we're charging half a million. So it really varies. It's kind of like for me, it's like doing analysis. What's your company about? What kind of demograph do you want to cover? What kind of exposure? What kind of industry are you in? Are you looking at glo global? Are you looking at local? So I have all these questions, and there, and there isn't one specific way I do, I do it. But I do have like this pricing around IBIers, and then and then we look at it from the standpoints how we're going to sequence it out, and then how we're going to break things down as well. A lot of times, too, a lot of times people wouldn't be ready for a corporate identity. They would be just ready for a presentation board to sell their idea. So in that case, you know, it'd be like 3500 bucks to sell your entire company's image, depending on what it is. That's just to give you a, a loose ballpark. So a lot of times companies aren't ready for the corporate identity. They might need be needing to raise money first, so then we come from a different angle of how we want to represent the company without going into that expense. When you were talking about branding, you had said there are low brands, which are literal representations, and then you know, high brands, which are more abstract. Oh, got it, right. And, and so for a new company that might not have much market exposure, would we want to go out there and be very literal so that people would see what we were talking about, or would we want to start off with symbols right away so that we could get some branding? Well, there's two ways to address that, is through, like, for example, you can create, I, I like looking at for long term, what would create the most value for the company where you don't have to redo it. Here again, most companies will do the mistake where they'll start and then start, stop and then start and then stop, meaning that the materials, they have to constantly redo it, where rather than if they started off right from the beginning that they're actually building more equity and value for the company, and they don't have to go through the expenses, which actually cost them far more if they did it right from the first time. So the way that I like looking at it is that you create a really strong corporate identity that you're going to keep, and then you could have a tagline or a slogan that it drives more specifically to the point of what your, what your company is about within your industry. That's one way of addressing it, but there's, you know, there's lots of ways. You could actually create a first mailing piece that actually describes what your company is about, so it's more copy driven and about the value you could bring to your customers, so you're bringing the, the, the key results at the top through a headline, so you could do a direct mail piece. Um, so there's different angles you could slice it, but more or less, when it comes to corporate identity, in my opinion, you know, it should be it should hold true for at least five years, you know. So it's consistent between even small companies to very very large companies. Exactly, exactly. That's a really good point because what we do, as far as our angle, we work the exact same way that we work with Fortune 100 companies to entrepreneurs. The biggest distinction is that, though, is that with entrepreneurs with small companies that are starting off is that they don't have to go through the headaches as the big companies have gone through. We're, stat we're giving them an image that gives them the image like a Fortune 500 image. So then they're already attracting the right customers rather than doing a lot lower vibration saying you're local but you're really not. Your vision is about being global. Why not create it so then you are living that vision now? So that's actually part of our trade secret. <laughs> but anyways, is that we actually design for the future. And we literally design for the future so you become that now rather than then waiting to become that. Howard, you were addressing the size of the projects. You were talking about the corporate identity all the way up and then you 
came back to something even earlier, and I remember the price was 3500 I forgot what you called it. Oh, like a presentation board. Okay. My question is, in sequence, given where some people are, where they're coming here with the seed of an idea, where would you suggest them looking at, thinking about, deciding on these different things in a sequential aspect? Well, that's a good question, and every company is different, so everything that we do is fully custom. So what we do is we do an analysis first. We, we have to first understand where the company is, where they like to be, and how we want to fill that first gap. And so a lot of companies, they may need like a presentation board. A lot of companies are ready for a corporate identity, and then what's after the corporate identity. So it, it just varies case by case. And it depends too, is if, are you designing something based on the company's image or the product underneath the company, or is it a service? And then what industry are you in too? So all those little things, those attributes make a difference as far as what we, what we would address first. A lot of times we'd say, you know what, you don't even have your team, you don't even have your team organized yet enough. You know, who's your marketing? Then I can give you suggestions throughout IBI who I would suggest you know, here, um, PR, you know, things, you know, um, you know, like what you do is, is the coaching to help people raise money, for example. So everybody will be at a different place, and then I would just do a quick analysis to figure out, well, this is what I suggest, you know, what would be the next sequence before even getting into branding. That's, you know. that's exactly where I was going, is for someone that has an idea, you're saying team, the, the, the business overview, possibly incorporating those things would all go prior to investing in a brand. Well, there's what there's called, what's, there's called the, the branding, the company, branding, the service, and product, and then there's called presentation boards to the investors. And could you explain what that is? Well, basically a lot of times when we want to sell an idea, like let's say, um, for like, you know, um, we're creating a new line of toy products for a company and they want to get into, you know, Walmart and they want to get into Costco and so forth and so on. The first thing we have to look at is presentation boards so they don't spend a whole lot of money and they create boards first to sell the idea. And then from those models, then we develop further and further and further. So there's ways of doing it where you're doing a more like you could say a high impact minimum investment and it's case by case as well. Like a lot of times companies may need package design, but they don't know all the, all the ins and outs just yet, but we need to create something that would sell to the investors, so then we would create a mock-up of what the package would look like. Mm -hmm. And that would earn a lot of, you could say, kudos in a sense of creating more money magnet to that investor because the investor's look at, looking at you being a serious player because it looks professional. So that attracts, becomes a money magnet. That becomes what's called in your, your magic folder. Any other questions? Yes? Having somebody, I'm sorry, uh, address the question about somebody having something patented and is unique in the United States and somebody in China or Japan replicating it and undercutting the marketplace or whatever. That's an attorney question, and there's going to be Michael Starkweather, and I think there's, it can, is there patent attorneys in here in the room right now? Oh, okay, because I think there's going to be a few patent attorneys here this week. That's a good question, and I don't know how to answer that because I'm not a legal guy. But that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Jess. Um, once you start uh, filing the patent in the U.S., you have 12 months to patent abroad. So there's due Good. to some laws and stuff. So. OK, thank you for answering that. Yes? Do you see any unique nuances uh, rolling out a new franchise as opposed to a completely um, company-owned uh, corporation rolling that out? I mean, there's some unique challenges in that you have partners in all your businesses. Well, the biggest thing about, because we're right now working on a franchise company, a restaurant, and it, it's, a, it's a lot more complex. 
And um, when you're talking about, a, when you, that's, that's a good point when you talk about a partner. Because the way that, and I could speak for anybody here, when you're working with someone like a brand strategist, it's really smart to have every decision maker on that call. That's the, way, that's the only way I could work. And you know, the only way I could work because it makes it work more efficiently and you're answering and answering all the concerns up front and you're also teaching each of those individuals that are on a call what the brand position is of your company. So the first thing I would say is that if you have a partner that you want to be making sure that you have the same vision. If you don't have the same, we actually, we actually, I actually have on our website a questionnaire designed specifically to make sure that everybody's on the same page, you know, and it's free. On our website, it's, it's housestudios.com, H-O-W-S-T-U-D-I-O-S.com. And it literally, it's this questionnaire and there's 24 marketing questions that were designed by three of my marketing people and myself. And it makes sure that everybody on a team, everybody is on the same playing field. Because what I find a lot of times that people are not on the same playing field, especially the partners. And that's where you run into a lot of um, frustrations on your end and headaches. And it costs you more too because then one person agrees and then another person doesn't agree but then you're halfway down a strategy. You know, so um, make sure with your partner that he or she has the same vision, and that's actually one of the key elements to a company is their vision, because without their vision, you don't have an idea where you're heading to, and you're flopping all over the place. And then the marketing is is your roadmap, you could say, towards that vision. The vision you never arrive to because you're always recreating it, but it's always large. And then, uh, and then your marketing plan is your roadmap of getting there, and then your brand strategy is making it tangible. It's putting things in tangible format. But the first thing is, yeah, make sure you're all on the same page as far as the vision. Is that House Studios, is that plural? Yes, H-O-W-S-T-U-D-I-O-S dot com, yeah. Hi, uh, we have a uh, car wash and I'm, we're looking to expand and, and become a regional player. And um, a lot of the marketing in my industry is, is simply mailing coupons out. And um, I'm, I was just wondering, you know, uh, that really doesn't seem like a you know, great marketing plan. Uh, well, uh, actually, you know, we, we don't know. The way that, the, that's a good question too, is, is that here we go to the self analysis. And then you want to have a strategy of being able to track things. So it could be like, you know, on your coupon, you say mention this code and receive another 5% off. That way you're actually tracking the success rate of that coupon. Because that coupon could be a gold mine. We just don't know yet how effective it, it is. And it could be that you want to expand that coupon, for example, online. And or expand it from the standpoint of referrals. You know, I can go on and on and think of all these ways of actually expanding that one idea. Mm -hmm. But to really understand how you're actually becoming successful or not is actually being able to track it. And that's where the market strategy and that's where the brand consultant can get together and strategize so you know if you're making growth or not. And you know where the corrections could be made too, by the way. And in, in our business, you know, it's one local establishment now and generally speaking, you know, your car washes on a local corner and it, you're clientele is basically in one or two miles and maybe on drive patterns of, of traffic. And um, I was just wondering if you had any other media ideas uh, to advertise because, you know, newspapers and overkill because they do 50 in my neighborhood or in my city, they do 100,000 homes or, you know, you can get inserts in just local neighborhoods. But right. are there any other media sources that you can think of that would be well, not off the bat without doing an analysis. And the, what you said just now, by the way, you might have an idea and perception that that's how you're getting your, your customers. But for you not interviewing them, I don't know if you have or not, if you've interviewed them, you might find a different answer than that. For example, when I go to my local car wash, it's not local, it's like six miles away. And the reason being is because they do a great job and I can rely on them. So it's out of my pattern of my line of traffic, you could say, of the shortest distance between that and another one. So you might want to first start off with doing an analysis on your customer, and then from that analysis, we determine what would be the next line of action. 
Yeah, I was wondering if you could give us some examples of co-branding other than retail and also any considerations, negative considerations, as well as positive considerations on co-branding? Oh, that's an excellent question. W when you want to co-brand, by the way, you want to brand with another company that follows the same vision and culture. For example, you know, like if I was in a, if I was in a B, Nike, I would want to co-brand maybe with the US Opens for the tennis because it's a fit or with, you know, NBA. You want to look where the fits are, and you want to look at if it's actually going to impact your brand in a positive way. Like, you know, you may not want to, you know, if you're in clothing, you want, may not want to, want to co-brand with Exxon or something like that, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying is you want to look at the culture if you're heading towards the same demograph of people, and, the, and that the people, the customer, can benefit from it. So you want to look at from the standpoint of benefit and value. You always want to look at from the perspective of your consumer. And that here again is one of the biggest mistakes um, companies make. They're always looking for their angle and their angle and their angle without even finding out what the customers really want. So you always want to look from their angle. But um, yeah, as far as co-branding, you want to look at the opportunities where it's a win-win-win, three wins all the way around, you and that other company, your company, and the consumer. Hi, um, my husband and I are part of a, a, a division of Citigroup. Uh -huh. So a lot of the marketing is already established and brochures. So what would you recommend for us where we can make it a little bit more special? And I guess that's kind of knowing the rules in order to break them. Um, but how would you recommend you, that we get specialized in you that? You have to find out, first of all, if there's any specific style, they, there's specific guidelines that they go by that their um, you know, licensees, licensors, um, have to follow. That's the first thing. Because you want, may want to do something differently, but if they don't permit it, you can get slapped in the face for that. And it actually could cost their brand. It also costs your image, because maybe it's a brand you could write on. You know what I'm saying? That they're a heavyweight and they have an image that they're per being perceived already that actually benefits you. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is if you can, you know, there's, there's something in the guidelines that says that you can create your own sub-brand underneath it, well then there's a whole strategy around that. But the first thing is you want to make sure that you're compliant with, with that company first. Because you can get in trouble. How would a media person or an uh, entertainer use branding to personify who they are in the, in the public eye? Well, you have to first look at what, what, is, what is your vision, what's your mission, what are your objectives, and how much exposure, and what are your touch points. So example with Oprah, she uses her media of her talk show, but then she has her magazines, right? So that magazine becomes another touch point, also another profit center for her, which is another line extension for her that extended from her show. So for, for, for individual, I always say you would want to brand the same way. Most people don't. They just have, here again, they splinter themselves or having one company do that, a graphic design company do that, an advertising company do this, PR company doing this with different typefaces, different colors. They're actually then, here again, they're, they're, they're actually fragmenting themselves. But your question is that as far as an individual, you would brand yourself the same way as far as the principles are concerned, as far as a corporate company, but your angle would be different. Here again, based on your media, your distribution, your channels, and your touch points. So you can't do it where you strengthen yourself right off the bat. Here again, most, comp most individuals don't do that because they're unaware of branding because branding's literally not taught in schools. It's something, you know, you you work with large companies, you can figure it out. <laughs> uh, one more question. In, in exchange for the $10,500 fee, I'm just curious what, <laughs> what, what, parts, <laughs> what parts can your company help us out with? What are your deliverables? How, what things can we delegate to you and so forth? That's a good question. The first thing is that what, in a, in a, in a, when it comes to creating a corporate identity, there's 12 major phases involved, and there's about seven calls between us and every decision maker. And we go through this whole process. This is first doing an analysis on a company, looking at your current material, figuring out the holes, 
looking at your competitors and asking you questions to who you know as your competitors and figure out what kind of image they're using. And then we look at your current material as well and we look at, well, does it look here again, is it congruent, is it congruent with the inside reality with how you're going to be seen? And most times, every time I've ever seen, but I say 90% because I'm sure it's 10% it's accurate, that you're speaking up here, but all your visual and your image, your corporate identity is speaking down here, speaking local, speaking, you know, small time. So then we would then um, do the research development, and then we come up with all these different concepts. This is the sequencing. We come up with a lot of thumbnail, what are called thumbnail ideas, which is the core idea, the core concept. And we might come out with literally 15 and 35 to 50 little thumbnails that would represent the company. And then we would pull, generally speaking, between um, three to five of them, even between five and ten, depend, depend, depending. And then we would sketch them tighter and then show you why each of those decisions, why they were made, and the science behind them. Not just the beauty of it, the aesthetics, but all the science and the, pr the practical reasons behind each of those. Because we'll come up with different angles based on the questionnaire. And then from there, we would then funnel and pull out between one and three of them and then create them as finished, completed marks. Meaning that they're polished, they're done in a the computer, they're tight, they're clean. And then we go through a whole color theory, the whole color system. And then we'd, sh we'd go through you know, literally thousands of colors and then show you between three and five color schematics and the reasons why against your competitors, the reasons why it would work for your company based on what you gave us feedback on your vision, your mission, your objectives. And then we go through the whole principle of your stationary design, okay? And we look at your typography, the type. It speaks different tones, like a stop sign is different than you know, a type that would be for a thank you note. Well, we, here again, we look at about 35,000 35, fonts. They all speak different tones. We narrow it down between three and five, and we show you that. And then we go into paper, paper is textile, how does it feel? to the consumer hand and then colors. And so that includes also the, um, the core stationary identity, a business card, letterhead, and envelope. So that whole process takes, generally speaking, about eight weeks long. And then there'll be 12 major phases, and then there'll be seven calls, and then be all these little in-between steps in between. So that your deliverables will be a corporate identity for your companies based on your vision, mission, objectives, your colors to your company, your typeface that you sh you'll be using from that point on, and also your stationary, which is your first brand extension. So, that's a good question though, because a lot of people ask that. <laughs> Doing it for a while. Uh, one more, and then we gotta call it the quits. great and so successful. So could you tell us again, what are the main reasons what made you such a top professional and what is it that keeps you such an excellent professional? Well, one is that I went to two of the best schools literally in the world and I, I actually, when I started at five, five years old, I knew what I wanted to do was to create. It's just a question of pinpointing me, advertising, computer graphics, whatever it may be. So that's why I was in school for eight years because I studied all of them architecture, computer, graphics, you know, advertising, so forth and so on. Then I went and figured out the two best schools I wanted to attend. And then after that point, I just worked my butt off. I was very, I, I love what I do, so I'm very passionate. And that's a key part to any company, in my opinion, is your passion, your drive. And that passion, my drive, and my, part of my passion and drive was innovation. So I could go on, but I created things that had never been done before for ABC networks, you know, Apple computers things that I was combining technology with creativity with branding. So then I was offering a lot more to companies and what keeps me going is always rethinking. So I never do the same thing twice and it's always based on innovation, principles, creativity, and fundamentals. Wow. Wow. <laughs>